Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming for this second session. Um, I'm Jim McNamara, and my colleague Madeleine Engels will be doing uh, this next session. Uh, as many of you know, I've been coming to summits for many years now. I think this is number six or seven, uh, and I'm a great supporter of AMEC and, and evaluation. Um, having worked in the, in the industry for almost three decades before I became an academic, I'm very mindful that we, we, need, to, um, we need to have basic and, and simple and fast metrics in many situations. In many cases, clients don't have a lot of budget, uh, don't have a lot of time. I also recognize uh, that there has been and still is a, a major focus on media monitoring and media content analysis in, in evaluation because media publicity uh, has traditionally been sort of the bread and butter of public relations. Although I do, uh, you know, I do advocate to the industry to think more broadly than public relations. In a, in a, we hear the term PR a lot in an era of integrated communication. Uh, so there is this considerable focus on basic metrics, but today Madeline and I want to do something different. Um, it's relevant to have and necessary to have these low-cost methods. Um, and, um, but what I've observed in many summits is that we tend to focus primarily on the fast, low-cost methods. Uh, we talk, about, though, about getting a seat uh, at the boardroom table, uh, meeting with senior management, being in the boardroom. Um, what we want to explore a bit today is, is what does it take to get into the boardroom? What does the ticket to the boardroom look like? Um, what I've observed doing uh, high-level evaluation with a number of governments, and I work with the UK government that you've heard from Alex Aiken yesterday, I work with the European Commission. What I've observed in some very high-level evaluation is that the firms that are doing it are Deloitte's, KPMG, Boston Consulting Group, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and occasionally companies like Cambridge Analytica. Uh, I don't want to talk about Cambridge Analytica today. I suspect they are a bridge too far in, in many situations. But um, my colleague today, Madeline from ACMEA International, ACMEA International is one of those organizations that is using high-level advanced analytics and evaluation. And so we'd like to, to share that with you, some examples of that today, because it's good to focus on the day-to-day, the -day, but I think we need to lift our sights. So this is what this workshop is about. When I say advanced analytics, what do I mean? I mean, or advanced evaluation, I mean rigorously conducted research using sophisticated methods that yields insights that directly and substantially inform strategy, and that in turn actually generates tangible, demonstrable results for the organization. And we'll, today, Madeline and I will going to present a few examples uh, of these things. Just before I do that, just to refresh our memory and, sh and sort of summarize where we've come from, we all know the basic program logic models of uh, our work, inputs, activities, through to outcomes and impact. We've got to be absolutely clear that in the boardroom, in senior management, their focus is not on data. Data is just the the means, it's the process of, of, uh, that we analyze. Management want to see outcomes. What do we mean by outcomes? There are three types of outcomes, basically. There is awareness change, or there's attitudinal change, or even more so, there is behavioral change. And this is what management is looking like. Obviously, change aligned to the types of changes that the organization wants to seek. And then in turn, they want to see impact. An impact can be financial or non-financial. Things like support for a cause or a high reputation or membership growth. It could be profits or cost savings and so on. It could, so on. It could be a reduced road toll. Now, we know that in reality, we have to do the inputs. We know that on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to do the things like the writing and the media releases, etc. And we have to put out stuff. But very, very importantly, we need to recognize that when you are doing inputs, activities, and outputs, you are a cost center in the business. It is only when we can produce and demonstrate outcomes and impact that we become a value-adding center. And I think everyone in this room intuitively knows that management, they don't like cost centers. They love value-adding centers. So our presentation is about how do we get to that stage. There is one exception, and that is at the input stage in early formative evaluation, we can often come up with insights that can actually change the way the organization is operating. Um, so we'll also talk about that. 
We're going to talk just about four examples of high-end uh, analysis today or high-end evaluation. Um, I'm going to talk about the first two, and then Madeline's going to present some examples from ACMAIA International of two others. I'll quickly talk about, and we have heard already about, social network analysis, but particularly moving to uh, inf social influencer mapping. I'll secondly talk about behavioural insights and give an example. And again, I'm sure you've heard of behavioural insights, but it's a bit like AI. We throw the term around, but do we really know what happens? How do you actually do it, and how can it translate to bottom line results? Madeline will then talk about net promoter score, but not uh, the way ACMA is using it's very, very interesting. It is not a simple score. Uh, I'll let Madeline speak about that, but there's a very good use of net promoter score in a special way that is actually driving change in the marketplace and driving business results. And the fourth one we'll talk about is customer journey mapping. Again, mentioned yesterday, but in a very broad sense, uh, we'll give you an, ex a, a, an actual example that happened in the last few months. So very quickly, I'll talk about social. And I won't spend a lot of time on social because we do spend a lot of time talking about uh, social media. The, the thing that worries me from my research, and I've been doing a lot of research with 48 organizations over the past three years, is that social media is universally used, but overwhelmingly used for distributing information. We are putting the new into the service of the old. We are using the new media to simply distribute our, our messages. And there is a lack of what I call systematic, intensive systematic listening through social media. Social media doesn't give us representative samples, uh, because not everyone on social is, there's even a negative skew in social, but it does give us a lot of access to listen to conversations. And so one of the key things is not only looking at the massive content and using content analysis, but looking at uh, identifying influences. They may be popular bloggers, they could be websites that do reviews, um, they could be so social media users with very large numbers of followers in our field, uh, and so forth. They could be certain respected organizations. And the sort of tools we're using there, very briefly, is with social network analysis, and you may have seen some of those, uh, and you can't read the numbers in this, but it's hard to extract Node Excel data. But looking at a particular debate, a particular topic, a particular issue, we can start to see hubs and nodes and also we can see linkages between them. So if we are interested in one of these conversations, and you can imagine it to be, this may be relevant to you, or it could be this conversation, what we want to know is on that issue or that conversation, who is driving it? And we can simply get that data very, very fast through uh, influencer mapping. We can look at the, the core, the hubs, and then there's another important thing that we can also see, of course, where we are in the conversation. And what we often find is the conversation is happening in a very intensive area of discussion, but our posts are not in there. We are not being linked in there. The other thing that's important often is, imagine if you're interested in this topic, but you're not in it. What you can see there is there is only a couple of very key linkages going into that. So I want to know who these guys are, particularly that guy there. I want to know who that is because that person is clearly a linkage from other discussions into that one. That person is an influencer. And what we start to do is get away from the mass of social media comment, there is so much of it, into very uh, targeted type information that says these are the key influencers, these are the drivers of debate, these are the hubs that people are going to for information. We need to be close to them, we need to be in, in connection with them. And so social network analysis and particularly influencer mapping is a very simple definition on screen. The mapping and measuring of relationships and flows between people. And we really need to understand those as well as understand the actual, the actual content. Um, I want to spend a little bit more time on behavioral insights because it's a, it's a very important area that's talked about a lot, uh, but not, not necessarily done all that well. And quite interestingly, of course, you know this originally came out, it was called behavioral economics. Uh, and you might be wondering, why was it called behavioral economics and then behavioral insights? Um, because very few economists work in the field. It came out of economics because economists, shock, surprise, realized one day that people make decisions not always on rational economic grounds. We actually make emotional decisions. 
took 100 years for economists to realise this, but uh, hopefully us in social sciences and humanities will know that. Um, so that was the big breakthrough, that they suddenly realised of all the rational decision-making, actually a lot of it was well outside of that. And therefore, the field really evolved through psychology because it's psychologists who really understand and study why people make it. So you'll hear language like understanding choice architecture. Choice architecture is how people make choices. Very simple, there's no great mystery to this. How humans make decisions and those discovering those underlying drivers of behavior. And you heard the comment, some of you in this previous workshop who were here, heard the comment that people lie. People lie in surveys, even when you t ask people they'll often tell you something different. But what we're trying to do in behavioral insights is go deeper and observe behavior to see what are the intuitive, the emotional, what are the drivers, uh, and this leads to nudge theory. And you would have heard that term from the book by Richard Taylor and Cass Sunstein. And nudge theory is when you understand choice architecture, how people make choices, what are those secret drivers that they often don't tell you, and you're then able to intentionally trigger those, mo so you can nudge people towards a decision. Very similar to the discussion on AI, of course, nudge theory can be used ethically and for good. Nudge theory can be also used by terrorist groups and others as well. So these are, these are research methods and, and, and technologies that we need to understand and use ethically. Um, just a bit of background, the behavioural, ins behavioural Insights came out of the UK government, originally a government-owned unit. It was then uh, floated off as a, a special purpose company and it now operates in the UK as BIT, Behavioural, behavioral Insights team, led by Dr David Halpern and is used intensively by governments in the US, uh, including in the Trump election, uh, Australia, the UK and other places. Let me quickly give you an example and this is the best way of showing it. So, a few years ago, the National Health Service in the UK uh, found that 5.5 million hospital outpatient appointments were no-shows. People would make an appointment and simply not turn up. Now, that's a real... Why is that a problem? Well, that's a problem because many of these hospital staff are on contract and they are paid to be there even if no one turns up, including after hours. And they estimated that these no-shows, failure to appear at an appointment, cost British taxpayers £225 million a year. So this is a significant cost. Um, and the background that's a little bit sad here is that they originally turned to the PR and communication people who wanted to devise a big campaign with maybe some TV ads and maybe some posters and brochures in doctor's surgeries. And then they turned to behavioural insight specialists who said, we have no clue what will work, but we will find out. And what they did was two randomised control trials, two RCTs in 2013-14, where they literally tested a whole range of mechanisms, whether it was brochures in doctor's surgeries, uh, whether it was emails, phone calls, reminders, etc. Very quickly, what they found by actually testing was that SMS text messages worked better than any other method. And probably no surprise there, but they didn't stop there. They then went on to say, what kind of text message? What do we actually say in the content? And they started to test the different ones, and they came down to four text messages that were tested across 10,000 people. It's a big sample, but this is all electronically done. It's all fairly low cost. The nudge testing, first of all, found, interestingly, and this is psychology, that conformity messages started to work well. If people thought that other people turned up for appointments and that it was a good thing to do, they were more inclined to turn up. But before that, they found that many people thought, yes, it was common practice, nobody goes to their appointments. So they had to change, change that and they started using conformity messages. And they started to see the needle tick up a little bit. They started to see the missed appointments come down. They went further though, they then found that personalising the language, because early messages, bear in mind this is a government department, so you can imagine how they wrote the message, you have a formal, you have an appointment on the 21st of July, uh, quite formal language, didn't have a lot of effect, just a little bit in conformity messages. But what they found is the moment they started to introduce personalised language, very simple, very personalised language, using the word you in that you have an hospital appointment or, or, or appointment to, to appear at. They also then started to experiment, what if they put in that cost figure? It cost the taxpayer £225 million a year by not turning up. Guess what? Nobody cared. That's the taxpayer, that's somebody else. I don't pay tax or whatever they thought. 
What they then did is said, let's try it if we say every missed hospital appointment costs you 40 pounds. Bingo. Suddenly we're seeing people really, you, personal, 40 pounds, I can identify with, yes, that's 40 pounds off my grocery bill next week. Uh, they could understand that. So we often make these mistakes of thinking of big campaigns, big figures. This was bringing it right down to the personal. And then they finally found, of course, with text messages, if they had that very personal message and then they had two buttons, click here to confirm, click here to cancel, um, they got huge results. So this happened over a period of uh, six to eight weeks. They reduced hospital appointment, missed appointments from in the control group that didn't get these messages, 11.7%. They reduced it to 8.3%. And we're talking over a three or four month period. That might, those figures don't sound much, but this might. That's 40 million pounds. For an expenditure of about 20,000 pounds, 40 million pounds direct saving. Now that's a bottom line result. Wouldn't you love to have that? I certainly would. So that's one example uh, of behavioral insights. It's nudge theory. Uh, it's getting inside people's minds, but it's a very different, it is totally research driven. You don't have any assumptions about creative. You say, I will do the research and I will test and test and test to find out what triggers people. So it's a totally research driven form of communication. To talk about the next few things, I want to hand over to my colleague, uh, Madeline, uh, from Mac Mayer International. Please. Thank you, Jim. And I have to tell you, I'm a little bit nervous to stand here, so bear with me for uh, a little while while I try to explain um, what it is that Jim and I have been doing uh, together. Um, I'm from Holland, um, and I work at Achmea, and Achmea is an insurance group. It's actually the largest insurance group in Holland, um, but we're the fifth largest in, uh, in Europe. Actually, we're very old. We were established in like 1811 already by a group of farmers who were taking care of each other. And that mutual thought, that cooperative, that's still in our company. So we're a very human company. Um, and we also have operations abroad. These were acquired in, in um, like, from 10 years ago and even further back um, for different reasons, um, but we're focusing on these companies because they add value to our business. And we're also focusing on transforming these companies because um, there is a lot of value in there. Um, one of the things um, that we're started to introduce, and I have to say, I'm not the expert on this. The real experts are in our companies. They are the people that are working with this on a daily basis, but I'll try to convert their message, be their ambassador as good as I can. Um, so we're using MPS. Of course, you know MPS as like the ultimate question, would you recommend our company, yes or no? Um, and of course, it's on a, on a scale of, uh, of zero to 10, uh, you know, about that. And, but I think what's interested is um, what we are doing actually, and I'm going fairly quickly because uh, as Jim said, most of you will know MPS. Um, I think what's more important is that we're using the closed loop methodology. So who of you has heard of that closed loop methodology in MPS? Like none of you? Okay, then I'll go slower. <laughs> um, and closing the loop actually, um, it means that we are, we're, it's actually a three-step process, the way I learned it. Um, and of course, um, it is all related to uh, getting to the core of what our customers truly think about, but also getting to the core of what kind of actions can we take to improve, really, to get um, true value from our, uh, our customers. Um, so if you look at the methodology, of course, there is a first wave survey, survey <clears throat> that we're doing in a, in a transaction. But what we're doing afterwards is we're taking um, people that responded to that survey and we're, we're calling them. And that's quite difficult for some people because it's not always a nice call because it can sometimes be customers that are angry and said, well, we don't like the um, uh, transaction we had or the service you offered us. Um, but it's very interesting what happens if you do apply that closed loop um, feedback. Um, so we can, I can show you here, that's a combined result. The minus 70, it's not the overall NPS of our companies, which is actually quite high. 
but it's uh, the MPS after the first, let's say, transactional survey, which is minus 70, and that is not very good. And in general, also the insurance branch doesn't score really well in MPS. But what happens if you dig deeper and if you start to take a look at um, what actually are the complaints that these people have, and try to connect with them and understand them really what it is that you could do as a company. And if we do that, we have a second survey and ask them, we have improved dramatically. It goes up to 12. And still, as we heard the previous speaker say as well, of course, the voting is different than the doing. And I think the doing starts also on our part. Um, and I could show you, that's, that's an extra example that we have. So if we take out one of the four companies and if we focus on only three of our companies, it goes up even more. So there is even a bigger gap. So there was really for us, uh, and, and we're still, you know, we're still learning and doing this. So we're, we're definitely not perfect. And also, um, it's not... Um, a perfect methodology. It's one of the things that we're using, but we found a lot of value in there, especially because we're, we're actually connecting to our customers and we actually get to do, of course, as much as we, we try as hard as we can to implement what, they are, um, what they're asking us. So the second, um, am I going too fast? You're looking a little bit worried? Okay. <laughs> the second, uh, advanced methodology I would like to, uh, to talk about is customer journey mapping. So, who of you heard about customer journey mapping? Some of you have? Okay. Well, I hadn't, but now I have. Um, and it's actually uh, taking it, it's more like a, a, a holistic um, view of um, the interactions that your customer has with your company. Whereas, you know, you can, you can look at single touch points that the customer has, but if you put it in a bigger perspective, it becomes even more interesting because you can see highs and lows. And Jim will also explain that um, in a little bit in a, in a next um, example. Um, so the three steps, of course, you probably know about them. Um, and let me take you to the next slide, if it's going to work. There we go. Um, so the example that we're showing is from our company in Greece, and that company is about 1,100 people, employees, and they, um, they are actually working uh, with customer journey mapping, I think now for maybe two years, starting to uh, explore the benefits of it and the effects on their, on their business. And you see, like, the journey um, and all the touch points are there going up and down, through the um, complete journey of the customer. So you can see also where um, the areas are that you can start to um, identify what it is that you could do, like what kind of buttons you can turn to actually um, change that. I see a gentleman who's sleeping. I'm not sure if I'm so boring. Sorry. <laughs> OK. Um, so I guess this is clear, right, um, how we're doing it. And, and it is all, of course, as the previous speaker said, there is a lot of tech out there. And, of course, we, we are looking into that and we're using it as well. But I really am a firm believer that we need to counterbalance that with just us, you know, <laughs> human beings, with people. Because in the end, an organization is nothing more than a bunch of people. So... This is uh, um, digging deeper into that customer journey and customer journey mapping. Um, so it shows you, and this is from um, an example where there obviously a customer had a car accident and filed a complaint. So that's also that you see something goes wrong already at the beginning of the process. So it gives us a lot of insights and um, um, ways to start dealing with customer complaints in a different way. So it's, it's actually acting upon, directly upon what they are uh, saying to us. So maybe you want to dive deep, a little bit deeper also in the, um, oh, shall I click it for you? Yeah. How we redesigned actually the process because that's also important to do. So this is, uh, Madeline's asked me to talk about this one because this is one I went, an example I went and studied 
while I was doing research there. So what we're doing in customer journey and in the NPS is particularly identifying the detractors, the unhappy people, but not stopping there. So we're learning and then following them up. Uh, and in this particular case, this was going beyond the data we just saw, which is where we identified some uh, basically two real low touch points. So someone has a, a, as an insurance claim, takes their car in, and we find that there's a problem near the beginning here about finding out the length of time. And uh, so when we, following this up, the company then went out and did a motion study of their actual car, in, car repair shops. And with that, don't worry about the numbers, but I'll quickly walk you through it. This is a motion study that said if you took your car in to get insurance, why would you bother complaining? Well, because you check in at reception, the car then goes to here, it then goes down here for the technical advisor, it goes back to here, it goes back to there, and it goes back to there. So first of all, there's an inefficiency, but also no one in the repair shops able to give you, the customer, much information about where the car's up because they're all separate. There is no single source of information. So they redesigned the process as a result of the research to have a process of one, two, three, four, five, six, cars finished, but most importantly, this little box here. They call it filter and distribution expert. This is a single person who coordinates the entire process, and the customer deals with one person. And so this radically changed the customer's experience going in there. And it's a, we give you this example because we also always talk about doing evaluation to change our market, our, our customers, to change the audiences. Evaluation also can change the organization to align to those customers. So the point I was wanting to make here is we're not only changing others, we're changing the organization. This is a learning organization. It's an adaptive organization. And as with the, in the NPS, those detractors, and that was the point to emphasize there, we were calling the detractors, and they were being turned into passives or promoters as a result of the follow-up. And here is the result of seeing a problem out of customer journey mapping, the company actually changes. So this is research that's informing process in the boardroom, changing the company, and substantially improving um, the result. I'm going to flick over the next slide in the interest of time. It's, just an ex it's in the slide deck. It's an example of McKinsey's data uh, about customer journey mapping. I want to introduce something else that Madeline is very passionate about and wants to talk about. Uh, last year, I talked at the summit about listening. And in my career, I've studied two, two areas of research, evaluation and more recently, organizational listening. And I thought for a while they were two separate projects, but it really started to occur to me that evaluation is really, really effective, intensive listening. Listening to our customers, our stakeholders, and that's what these things are. And just to share a few thoughts with you about my listening research that relates to evaluation, is what I found is that listening is required uh, but just to define listening, listening is not the same thing as hearing. And any of you who are married or got children probably know that you'll be commented on that you're, you, you say you're hearing, but they say you're not listening. Listening, just by definition, is giving recognition, meaning we don't just selectively listen. We recognize anyone who wants to speak to us. Very importantly, we're paying attention. We're gaining an understanding as these examples did, understanding that customer with the frustration of being, getting their car repaired and then giving consideration to what they say, not always agreeing, but at least giving it consideration and responding in some way. Um, the, what I came out of that research with is an idea that there had to be an architecture of listening in an organization. Now, I say this because what we do, we talk about PR and communication and advertising, but when you look at it, what my research found is that 80 to 95% of the resources spent on communication are spent on distributing the organization's messages, up to 95%. And we spend much, much less on ways of listening. And that, to me, was one of the problems. And then I started to say, well, what, what should we do? And my answer was, of course, we build an architecture of speaking for our organization. But we should balance that with an architecture of listening if we're really going to be in touch with and understand audiences and, and customers and other stakeholders. And I actually went as far on this, as you can see on the slide, I defined, based on the research, I've, where I found good listening, I looked at what did they have. And it's not just technologies. There's a view, a view always that oh, technologies will do it. What I found is organizations that were good at listening, and there are some, first of all had a culture that they actually wanted to learn. They actually wanted to listen to people. 
and I found other organisations actually didn't want to, not, not maliciously, but they simply believed they knew it all and they were too busy wanting to tell people. And then, of course, I found it was avoiding the politics of listening, which is where you exclude some people. Policies, structures, we've talked about many of these in the workshop, but the point I wanted to make here and hand back to Madeline briefly is that culture is really, really important. We need a listening culture, not just a speaking culture in our organisation. So, Madeline, you want to say a little bit more about culture and how we've had to work on culture in ACMEA, not just technologies. Yes, <clears throat> and that's exactly right. Um, and what I forgot to mention in the previous section is that Jim has been doing really in-depth research in three of our companies into the value of listening. Uh, and our CEOs confirmed that they really want to put this on the agenda because they also see value in that, which is more than just money. So before I go on, I'd like to do a little exercise with you. So I would like to ask you to find a partner like someone who you're sitting next to, maybe someone you don't know that you're sitting next to. Uh, it's going to take us about two minutes, um, so find someone. And what you do is, I, the one person, if I know how important speaking is to you, but one person is going to tell a story about your name. And the other person is going to listen. You're not going to interrupt, you're not going to ask questions, you're going to listen. You have two minutes for that. Thank you. <clears throat> and I was just wondering how that um, conversation made you feel. I mean, one person was speaking and the other one was supposed to listen, but I could tell that it was really hard to listen. So a lot of people were interacting, a lot of people were giving nonverbal signs. So I'll just leave it with that. You have made a new friend, maybe, or a new acquaintance because you've told somebody else about your name. But it's really something, uh, this I learned from, a, from an Astra Israeli professor, it's really something, especially in our boardrooms, our CEOs are not really um, accustomed to being really fully listened to. And on the other hand, it, for them it's also hard to really listen. So, at the beginning of this year, um, we actually said, all this is what is happening in the world. We need to counterbalance that with, with us, with human beings. So we said, apart from investing in technology and everything that we're doing, we really need to start also increasing our investment in our people. Because our, our people, that's really what we believe, are our, you know, our greatest assets. 
So we have designed a leadership journey, and that leadership journey is for ent our entire top management across all our companies. Um, and we really believe that um, um, investing in people and investing in leadership is going to give us a competitive advantage. If you tie that to listening and also to organizational listening, that's even increasing that further. That's our firm belief, and that's why we're investing in listening and in leadership. So I've just drawn this um, as a, sort of like a virtuous cycle because I started to connect things and see that they relate to each other. Um, whereas the organi organizational listening part that Jim has been, been researching is really crucial and important, but we need something more because we need to get to the source of behavior of people. So, as Jim said, culture is one of the uh, first canons of listening, of, a, of an architecture of listening. So we were already for a long time trying to transform the cultures and help transform people, of course, because they determine the culture. So this is a, the influencer model uh, from McKinsey where they have found that transformations are eight times more likely to succeed if you combine outside in and inside out. Um, and actually, um, what we did was, um, um, how do I put it, um, or let's say how I see it is that the, the outside in transformation um, is linked to the organizational listening, for example. But what is more important also is the transformation of the inside out of people because we know we need to get to the source of behavior of people if we really want to have a transformation happening. So that's why we said, well, people have to become aware of their underlying patterns of thoughts and habits that are automatic responses but are really not necessarily effective behavior. So that's actually what we said, well, we need some, some help there and we have found the leadership circle um, framework. And this might interest you because most of you is, of course, um, measurement and evaluation people. Um, and there is a huge black box behind it. It's, it's actually a worldwide database that is growing. And it's a growing norm base of leaders. Uh, but also, you know, everybody is a leader in the end uh, of people that are being uh, uh, assessed in a 360 degree assessment on their behavior. And actually what was interested also for us and why we really ticked on this framework is that um, it really explains how, uh, let's say, if you look at the, the, the circle on the left and if you look at the top you see creative and if you look at the bottom you see reactive. So the, let's say, unconscious behavior of, of people is rooted in reactive but that tree, let's say, where it is rooted in reactive, can turn into creative. So on the top, you see 18 creative leadership tendencies that are really um, driving effective leadership. So that is part of the transformation that we're going through, that we really want people to transform from reactive behavior to more creative behavior. And you see, as was measured by the leadership circle profile, that there is a strong correlation between the two. 10% in their da database of leaders of, uh, let's say, the best performing companies show creative behaviors, uh, whereas the least performing show reactive. So that was also something that's really interesting. So we're tying those two together, organizational listening, leadership, uh, and development, because we truly, truly believe that in the end, no matter, no matter how much technology you put in, our people at all levels, not just the top, but also at the bottom, are going to make the real difference. I guess I can hand back to you now, yes. right? We're going to summarize. Thanks, Madeline. Uh, we're going to wrap up, so there is time for questions. So I'll just try and pull some of those various threads together. I know we've moved through it quickly. Um, but what we've really tried to show here and challenge you to think is that evaluation is much more than looking backwards. It's not a rear view mirror. Sometimes we look backwards to collect data, but only in order to understand the future. We need to also, I've suggested, we need to look beyond media metrics 
and, and media generally. We've got to remember media are important, but media are channels, media are intermediaries. They are ways we get to an audience in order to do something, ideally. So ch we have to get beyond that, and that's still a challenge, I think, for this whole industry. We also know, and we hear this all the time, but we need to show outcomes and ultimately impact or potential impact of what we do, which is what management wants in the boardroom. And hopefully some of the examples we showed you um, can sh really do show actual bottom line impact on the organization and even on society. Um, evaluation can provide valuable, in we, we use this term insights a lot and we, off we throw the term around, but what we tried to do in the presentation is show you specific examples of insights, how understanding hospital patients who don't turn up for an appointment, how we could change their behaviour and have substantial cost reductions, how we could fundamentally change the way an insurance company goes about car repairs, uh, et cetera, how we could do net promoter score that, and my slide screen's gone blank, um, down there, uh, how we could change net, use net promoter score to not just find out what people don't like us, but to find out why and then to actually address that. And that, of course, leads to customer retention. And now we're going forward, we can start to put a dollar value on customer retention. How many customers stay because detractors are very likely to, to go. Also, I've tried to emphasize in showing these examples of behavioral insights, NPS with closed loop methodology, customer journey mapping, that there are advanced social science research methods out there, and they are being used. And it's a great pleasure working with ACMAYA International, you know, with the sort of culture change from the top that they really want to listen. They want to be a learning organization. They want to show leadership in those areas. We need to be able to, we're on that journey, we need to speed up and catch up to some of the leaders that are in the field. And what I've tried to show, we hear a lot about technology. Technology is definitely important, but it, we need culture change, we need leadership, and we need knowledge and skills. Um, that's often passed over. It's no use having a really smart car if you can't drive, right? Uh, we've, we, there's a lot of technologies coming down the line. We need to be able to drive them. To have the changes we want, we need to be dressed up like this dog is. We need to smarten up. Uh, if you can't drive, some of these advanced technologies, do what this dog did, get a chauffeur, work with partners, and many of them are here at this conference, work with partners who are experts in the field, work with academics, as uh, ACMAIA is doing, uh, with a whole range of specialist suppliers. So there are people out there who can help us on the journey. So hopefully, we're gonna stop there. We have time for questions. I think we did pretty well on time, trying to cover a lot of material, uh, and hopefully leave you with some stimulating thoughts of next steps, getting, getting beyond. Because to me, when you, do, when you do get into cutting edge evaluation, it's not the end of the journey, it's just the beginning. Thank you. <laughs> if you could give your name and where you're from as you ask a question so we know. Hi, my name's, oh, hey there. Uh, my name's Mark, I'm from Prime Research, and I have all the questions, but I'll kind of dial it back to just one. You're talking about the architecture of listening and uh, when you're looking at the different companies, you notice that they had different cultures towards it. Can you talk more about the outcomes and the impacts that they had, these different cultures and what it meant for their business? I was focusing specifically on uh, how an organization listened in order to respond to its customers, its marketplace, and therefore you know, gain advantage from that. Um, and what I found initially is uh, there was a focus on technologies. And I sort of end up building the architecture backwards. Everyone said technologies, and then you need to know how to, how to use them. But what I found is the things that Madeline talked about, where there was strong leadership and where there was a culture of wanting to know and of, of wanting to learn uh, was very, very interesting. A number of high sort of modernist organizations uh, had the belief that they are experts or their teams were experts. We are here to tell people. Interesting, I did a word cloud based on 104 interviews with communication leaders uh, of when I asked them the question, what do you do? What is the essence of your job? And the words in the word cloud that dominated were informing, telling, advising, teaching, instructing, motivating, mobilizing, etc. Nowhere was there learning, listening, etc. And so that's what led me to suddenly believe that culture has got to precede a lot of these things. And how do we change that culture? We need leadership. And we heard a bit about that in one of the sessions yesterday, about you know, having data behind you that can lead, let you stand up in the boardroom and give strong advice to management. And you do need receptive management. Um, 
which we're unfortunate to have in ACMEA. But culture is, is critically important. Wanting to learn, wanting to know, not believing you know it all, and truly believing the customer, the stakeholder, the, the student, the patient, whoever it is you're dealing with, is important. We use this word customer-centric a lot, but we don't often mean it. You know, it's organization-centric in most cases. Sing out if you want to add. Richard Bailey, PR Place. I'm wondering what we should call this discipline you describe. Yesterday morning, David Rockland looked into the not-so-distant future and I think saw the end of public relations. Robert Phillips has called it public leadership. You, I think, will call it public communication. But I'd just like a little bit more analysis. What should we call the discipline you've just described? It's a debate going on around the world at the moment. Um, and yeah, in my university, I call my program public communication because we teach, we don't teach interpersonal communication. We teach everything that's public, advertising, government communication, political, organizational, PR. Um, I don't know the total answer, but what I do know is integration is happening. All the big agencies you go into now, they are doing pay, they're doing earn, they're doing sh shared media, they are using different technologies, and the clients don't really care. If you want an outcome, you actually don't care how you get it. In fact, a lot of senior executives are saying to me they don't even want to see the data. We take in reports full of data, and they say, no, no, just give me the insights. What do I need to do to be a better business? And so I think we're seeing, and customer journey mapping is really interesting because what it tells us is no one thing is causing the impact. It's the cumulative effect. So we've got to understand and take the word out customer, take it out and put in stakeholder journey, patient journey, student journey. Uh, we've got to understand that. So I think we have to think more broadly. And in my academic work, we, have, we teach public relations subjects, but we're not even sure we're going to keep teaching them. You know, we might teach media writing, um, but public relations, the silos are disappearing. I think it's sort of 20th century language. Even the term advertising is disappearing. Uh, so I think we're facing an era of integration, but what I do know in evaluation, if we want to measure attitude and awareness and behavior change, there are multiple touch points, multiple drivers. If you want to be an evaluation specialist, you really got to get across them. Um, and then you can identify what's driving best and what to use and what not to use. I've become a fan of customer journey mapping because of that. I thought it was a buzzword for McKinsey for a while, but it just gives you that holistic picture. Um. Question for Madeline. There's a question for Madeline. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeroen Scholten from Publistad, uh, also from Holland. Um, you were explaining that uh, you could improve customer uh, satisfaction by calling the distractors. Uh, using the phone, I think, uh, literally speak to them. What are the numbers we are talking about? Is it 766 was the end score in those charts. That was the total group. The total group. Yeah. Including, the uh, distractors are 50 or 100, something like They're that. They're just called the detractors. So in the NPS, you yes. find out your promoters, your passives, and your detractors. And so the call center, they gave extra training. And then any time they're not involved in an inbound call, the especially trained people are making outbound calls to detractors. Not every operating company is doing it as well as Madeline knows. We're still teaching them to do that. But the results coming in, you know, when you can lift a negative 71 detractor score yeah. to a positive 24, that's a lot of customers probably saved. Yeah, that's it's quite an operation there. Uh it is, and we're starting small, and it's also something that needs to grow in the minds of people because obviously, you know, the, the, the call center people are used to getting inbound calls and responding to that, and um, tied to the listening, we're also training them on empathic listening, which is, you know, connecting also in a different way, but we have to free up some time with these people or maybe get some more people, we don't know, because we're juggling with this as well and trying to implement it, um, that this is a different mindset. This is really coming from a different, uh, yeah, let's say, um, different starting point if you have to call back. And that's sometimes, not everybody is able to do that. Yeah. Some people really can't. But what's so exciting and relevant to evaluation is that we're doing these things and trialing them and evaluating them. And when you can see that result, minus 71 to 24, that can then inspire management to put resources to it. And it can inspire staff to say, this is valuable work. So we are starting small, and it takes a lot of effort, but that's real change in an organization. It's impossible without good evaluation to show that this is having a bottom line impact uh, on the business. 
Thank you. So I love evaluation. <laughs> We are five minutes ahead of schedule. Good. There's a question. It's always good time, Dali. Hello, my name is Stefan Rufenach. I'm from Germany, um, company Rate. Um, my question would be, um, this is very interesting, uh, what you showed um, for external communications. Is, are there any insights you can give for internal communications uh, talking to associates? Do you want to start? Yeah, I'm trying to um, to understand your question exactly because it, you're you're referring to internal comms. Yeah, to internal communication. So, are you saying uh, are we also communicating these results in our company internally to other people? Or? Yeah, you can use it internally. Oh, as if we were having MPS internally in our company. Um, I don't know. Maybe they are doing it in our in our. Not using our MPS. Companies. Customer sat studies are done regularly, and employee surveys are done. So they're doing internal employee satisfaction surveys. Um, but there are experiments happening. Zilver and Chris is doing yeah. uh, online co on online collaborative work where staff are involved in actually designing products. Uh, so that to me is like an ultimate form of listening where you're getting people in as collaborators. So not using those particular tools, but are using employee surveys, focus groups with employees, online discussion groups, etc. But your point is a key one. We've got to be listening to the internal audience as much as anyone. They often carry a lot of knowledge of the, of the organization and they are also the people talking to customers every day. Good point. Well, Barry, you should love us because we finished ahead of schedule. Unless there's no further questions, we thank you very much. Thank you.